but hear your talk today. Raj, I'd like to thank you. I'd also like to thank uh, your uh, co-director as well, Dr. Nader Dahtele, who uh, are allowing me to be able to um, present to you all today. Um, please allow this to be interactive, so feel free to uh, stop me at any point um, just to kind of go over um, any, anything that you'd like clarification or even ask questions. Uh, allow this to be very open and free. Um, as Dr. Baj mentioned, uh, can you see my screens? Okay, good. Um, as Dr. Baj mentioned, uh, my name is Jamel McLennan. I'm one of the uh, uh, neurosurgeons that, that works primarily out of the, the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. I also work at the Phoenix Children's Hospital as well, hoping to uh, tackle and take care of uh, complex spinal deformities and allowing opportunities for both our adult and our pediatric populations uh, a chance to kind of, uh, kind of live a normal life here. So uh, thank you for allowing me to be able to present to you today. A little bit on our agenda will be uh, me discussing kind of the, the kind of my assessments and thoughts regarding how we kind of plan uh, this particular population, both in the adult and the pediatric population, how we think about safety as far as instrumentation placement, uh, both in the, the relatively straightforward um, spines in addition to some of the complex deformity, uh, decision-making regarding how we can further optimize our operating room efficiency, get patients on and off the table after we make decisions for uh, instrumentation to be placed. Also, uh, intraoperative neuromonitoring, uh, essentially the safety aspect to make sure that our nerve signals and our nerve conduction is satisfactory and appropriate as we're doing some of the complex manipulations. Um, also blood loss considerations, because though we, we do have the capabilities of transfusing individuals' blood and blood products, we oftentimes like to, whether it's recycle their own blood or, or try to minimize the amount of blood that's lost, and then also minimizing radiation exposure to both the uh, patients and then also to ourselves as uh, operating room uh, uh, physicians and, and allied health personnel. So uh, transitioning now, so when we think of spinal deformity and, and spinal pathology, we really got to put it in separate categories. And so I'm going to kind of zoom in on this area because they're really different disease processes, that which happens in the uh, pediatric population. Yes, there's a host of different conditions that we do uh, that, that we do come into play, but the truly the idiopathic type or the type that actually has pediatric deformity is, is really a different sort of uh, pathology that the adult has. Uh, yes, there is adult progression. Uh, of pediatric patients who decide not to get treatment as a, as a child into the adult, but oftentimes a lot of the adult, the adult, excuse me, adult degeneration uh, that does manifest as scoliosis really is related to an arthritic or facet arthropathy process. And then we get to the iatrogenic or the, the revision spinal deformity that does happen in, in patients. So um, where we are and how that makes uh, appropriate sense. Oh, and I do want to go and thank um, all my mentors, including Dr. Nader Dahtele um, and, and his wisdom and training that uh, he allowed for me uh, to uh, work with him at, uh, at Northwestern. But really our idiopathic deformity, and, and when we think of the, the young person, you know, we never really want to uh, consider an operation or an operative intervention on a child until we actually allow to see some form of a progression. And having the idea and the knowledge that the curves are going to progress, it is important for us to follow them over time. So this patient, as you can see, was followed over a six-year time period, and perhaps we may have followed them too much. Perhaps the, the window of intervention should have been much before this uh, particular time. But notwithstanding, you can see that based on our tools and our armamentarium, we, do, we can allow for an improvement of their curvature and their scoliosis with a spinal deformity operation. But the question is, could we have done a lot less and, and should we have done something sooner? Um, that always is something in the back of our mind as, as surgeons. For the adult side and the adult class, the adult uh, um, spinal deformity, we do put patients into certain categories and classifications, how much somebody is malaligned. We have different scores and alignment uh, 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 classification parameters that we use based on the relative um, uh, sway that they have in their lower back, the positioning that they have within their pelvis, um, the amount of distribution of the sway that somebody has, uh, furthermore, um, their age as well. We can also place a different classification or the Rasuli classification, looking at the amount of sacral slope that they have or the, or the, the defined parameters uh, between a measurement of the tilt that they have within their sacrum um, and put them in certain categories that will then allow us to classify what patients need should they actually need an operative intervention. 
and without going into too much detail, these sort of classifications and, and how we uh, put patients in these particular type of um, uh, algorithms, if you will, dictate how we ultimately are going to consider operative intervention for them, whether they have a high slope within their sacrum or a low slope, and how much sway they need in their lower back is one mechanism or class classification for the adult population that we may not necessarily see in the pediatric population. Piggybacking on this idea, both the Rasuli and then also this other GAP score. Oh, yes, please. Sorry to interrupt. Just a quick question regarding the last slide. Oh, yes, please. Um, we're going to try to kind of uh, engage engage you here with some questions. We're going to put you on the spot. We know you probably just finished like a 10-hour surgery, but... Uh, no worries. <laughs> all right. So uh, I'm, I'm personally interested in, 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 in this and kind of lumbosacral pathology. And, and a lot of us, you know, who, who treat lumbosacral pathology, whether it's listhesis or other conditions, when it comes to these high-grade spondylostheses, right? It, yes. I feel like this topic comes a lot. You see, you see, say, an adult or a young adult, not necessarily a teenager, but let's say a young adult with, with high-grade uh, spondy, grade three, grade four. Um, tell me how, in your practice, you're translating the Rasuli classification into actual technique. So, uh, for which of these types are you actually reducing? Are you doing inner bodies? Are you not doing inner bodies? Are you fusing in situ? Can you just spend 30 seconds how in your practice and, and your training, how you, how you basically go from that classification system to what you actually do surgically? And I apologize yes, perfect. if you're going to present that later, but no, I'm this... going to forget later. So I thought I would ask you now. No, this is perfect. So the, the first thing that I knew for through your example that you're describing, or uh, essentially Dr. Uh, Baj is referring to how much, um, uh, essentially uh, how much of the L5 vertebra or any vertebra uh, notwithstanding has moved forward or slipped forward uh, based on this relationship to the sacrum. I oftentimes would want to get an idea of how much compression of the nerve elements or neural elements there are, in addition to um, whether there is any uh, aspect of um, um, uh, alignment ma manifestations or alignment malformations that is present. So even though the focus on the low grade or even high grade spondy focuses at the lumbosacral junction, I do want to get an appreciation of their overall global alignment or their posture how much they're compensating in their thoracic spine and their lumbar spine, I can put it into a particular category, both within this particular classification and also in the global alignment score. So if a patient has a high grade slip, and oftentimes it typically is a type three or a type four, where there is a high degree of a sacral slope or a high, uh, this angle here, then oftentimes I have an idea that if the patient is globally aligned, or globally malaligned, that tells me how much I need to calculate in my correction for um, uh, for instrumentation and repositioning of the of the actual spine itself. All the meanwhile, making sure that I pay very close attention to um, their neural elements and making sure that those are decompressed. Also, making sure I'm going to get a bony union from the actual correction that's offered. And then to make sure I have a restoration of their overall um, uh, uh, spinal alignment so that if they are sagittally malaligned, they are then um, uh, aligned in that particular plane as well. All the meanwhile, all the factors that I'll kind of talk about uh, uh, future uh, in a little bit, you know, based on the patient age, based on what my goals of the operation are, how strong their bone is, um, whether I feel like there is a need to get circumferential fusion, I may or may not add inner bodies. I may or may not put instrumentation directly from the sacrum into the actual ilium, depending on their age as well. Um, I, I'll make decision points as far as how many anchor points are needed um, caudally or, or, or kind of at the base. A lot of different factors um, I kind of put into consideration depending on age and and quality of life uh, parameters that they may that they may give me as well. And so I know it's a long-winded answer, and I could actually keep going on with that particular answer. Yeah. But I but I have I put all the patients in these particular uh, uh, score classifications to see if I can actually have an improvement uh, uh, for them to allow for overall balance and harmony within their spine. Yeah, no, I I think that's excellent. It's very helpful. Uh, and you're right. We can literally spend the whole hour just talking about, um, about uh, you know, listhes, uh, lumbosacral listhesis and high-grade listhesis, but, uh, but that was great. Thank you so much. No problem. And uh, what I like about the 
the, the global alignment proportion score is that I can actually look at the, the amounts of distributions that they have of sway within their body, their overall pelvic balance. But even still, even if I correct their score, if you will, this validated score down to what is considered, particularly within this patient here, if I can get their proportionality such that their overall score that we can plug into this equation down to their spine being proportional, that still does not have a true harmony that their um, overall health related quality of life parameters um, will be much higher than before their operation. Yes, their spine will be balanced, but we still have a lot of work to do to make sure that getting patients who have a proportionality within their overall spinal balance and alignment, that that actually matches their quality of life as well. We suspect so, and a lot of literature tells us that we're getting closer, but there's still a bell curve phenomenon that there are other outliers um, that are outside that. Um, this is an example of how I use this particular score. This is a, kind of a 60-ish year old gentleman who had um, a previous instrumentation, pretty significant uh, a spinal malformation, uh, excuse me, a sp spinal malalignment. Uh, he had a very large uh, levoscoliosis in the lumbar spine. And I can use some of the information, the equations, and getting my patient back into an alignment that say that even though uh, he's still within the moderate disproportional uh, scale. Uh, I still have to put that on a health-related quality of life parameters uh, to make sure that he's actually doing better um, than, his, than what his scores would project here. So I do use these scores for my adult populations to allow for an improvement. This is a case that uh, I just wanted to show you, and I did another one very similar to this, is that, uh, so uh, I switch back and forth with my adult and my pediatric population, not because they're a, a similar disease process, but that's a significant portion of my practice. Um, but a lot of the same parameters and the same ideas um, hold true, and that the goal is to try to halt the progression of these curves and to allow for the spine to be in an alignment. One of the earlier slides that I showed you is that perhaps maybe we wait too long and following patients patients in time. And clearly this patient here has a very, very large curve and we have power within, within our instrumentation to allow for correction. But the challenge is, is getting to patients much before they get to this. So the magnitude of the surgery uh, uh, that we're seeing here is not necessary. But we do have confidence that we're allowed, that we can fix and improve these pathologies. So um, a lot of times in order to actually get patients to the operating room, we need to make sure that they're safe and we have all of our checks and balances in place. And so uh, we need to, if the patients have a couple of disease process, we'll have our internal medicine colleagues or our pediatricians do their evaluations. Uh, there are clinical pathways that have been shown to be helpful for patients who have um, uh, per, uh, particular uh, disease process that through algorithms, we can actually see if patients will follow that algorithm and uh, make sure that we have compliance and allowing for efficiencies within operations uh, and really building a team uh, around you with the shared vision of helping this population ultimately is going to be a, a large benefit for individuals who, um, who need treatment and need surgery. So what we have at our institution is that we have various spine classes. So we take their clinical photos, uh, we obtain patient reported outcomes, um, and we see if we can actually match the expectations we have as surgeons um, to the expectations that families have as well. So that even with uh, significant neuromuscular populations and cerebral palsy patients, as we see down here, we can get them through operations very safely. Um, at our pediatric institution uh, as well, we have um, uh, essentially four different algorithm uh, trees in which uh, our pediatrician and our anesthesiologists and us know that the patients are going to fall into one of these particular uh, clinical pathways. Um, and so it's uh, very streamlined for our patients to fall within this. And so follow up and, and all the nuances are, 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 are automatic, if you will, to hopefully allow for efficiency for patients' hospitalization stays and, 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 and through that regard. Um, but it's very critical, even with very relatively straightforward curves and straightforward spinal curves, that we don't forget the neurosurgery side of a lot of this. So yes, there are a lot of times there are drivers uh, within scoliosis, but oftentimes our dextroscoliosis are more common to have uh, uh, be an idiopathic type. But some of our levoscoliosis, we're going to uh, we need to make sure, particularly on some of the younger patients, uh, we get uh, imaging to make sure that they don't have a tethered cord or a syrinx or a Chiari malformation. Now, um, 
oftentimes 40% of the, of the time, if we image patients with scoliosis, they're gonna have some aspect of a neurologic um, process, whether that's a, a tumor or a Chiari or having some uh, tethered core, they're gonna have some malformation. So it's important for us to do our due diligence to be able to evaluate and check these patients. So this is a patient who had this and had the Chiari decompression and had the reduction of the syrinx, but unfortunately only 60% of the time are we actually gonna have an improvement in their scoliosis. So we need to make sure that uh, we overall allow for her to grow up and be the, the great young lady that she is um, so we can do a spinal instrumentation. But we also need to make sure that we're gonna use the metal that will allow us to be able to view and visualize the spine. So perhaps maybe a metal that has less scatter when she goes for her MRI would be most prudent to make sure that her syrinx doesn't develop or, or get larger. So a lot of things that we place into consideration uh, for our patients. Jamal, sorry, oh, yes. Add, uh, oh, good, please. Apologies, just to interject uh, one more time here. Um, no, I welcome this, thank you. Case, and and, and, and uh, you mentioned metal. So can you tell us a little bit about what, uh, what you do use or what you did use in this patient? I mean, right, so when we talk about the biomaterials, you're going from stainless steel to titanium to cobalt chrome, et cetera. Tell us a little bit about um, uh, choice of rod material in these uh, adolescent and pediatric population. If you can give us two minute kind of review on that, that I think would be helpful to our audience. Great, yeah. Um, so a lot of our instrumentation, uh, we have uh, options and choices. Um, historically, um, uh, there had been uh, opportunities for us to use uh, uh, essentially wires, uh, hooks, um, in addition to the, uh, the, the pedicle screw instrumentation. Um, and based on us being able to, one, balance us uh, being able to get fixation and grabbing a hold of the spine, um, and then ultimately being able to move the spine into a harmonious alignment in which us as providers want us to move the spine, we need to make sure that we can balance that overall objective. Now, we had um, stainless steel instrumentation, which we had found to create a significant amount of, amount of scatter, uh, particularly when patients are placed uh, in um, uh, uh, an MRI machine. And so we then tested that, that same amount of scatter with cobalt chromium, and we actually improved our physics uh, in that we have metal subtraction uh, technologies available uh, to allow for an improvement in visualization. But we even saw an even better improvement, even though the uh, compliance of the rod and the, and the yield point of the rod is less stiff on titanium, but we can visualize the spine so much better um, with the use of titanium. So for us, we wanted to find the least number of instrumentation that we would need in addition to using a titanium rod, if we could, to be able to allow for a harmony. So we probably could have used even less instrumentation here, but there were parts of us that wanted to make sure that we had nice balance and harmony, um, but we also used a titanium rod that would allow us for, that would allow for us to be able to visualize um, uh, the, the cord, uh, depending on an MRI. So um, we went from stainless steel to cobalt chromium um, to either a titanium alloy or pure titanium um, that will allow us to, for, to be able to better visualize. And I'm going in incrementally uh, lower aspects uh, that will allow us to have improved visualization. Great, thank you for that. Uh, a question uh, A question from uh, one of the participants. and. And that is a really good, very good question because it's gonna it comes up a lot, which is when you when you see these adolescents or or you know perhaps even younger kids um, with with spinal deformities, like you mentioned, sometimes they'll they'll come with two or three presentations, right? So Chiari, scoliosis, or let's say scoliosis and high grade spondy, um, uh, or even a low grade spondy. What do you, what is your thought process on on what you do first, and how long do you wait? what's the interval uh, wait time between procedures? Um, say an example of Chiari and Scoli, then example number two, uh, Scoli, that's surgical, uh, Scoli and say a, a, a Spondy, L5S1 Spondy. Great, um, so, uh, so for the first example, um, what I oftentimes do is uh, I, uh, we, in our literature, we know that a uh, significant portion of the, uh, of the time that the scoliosis is oftentimes driven by the neurologic uh, abnormality or driven by the Chiari or driven by the, the, the syrinx. And so I typically will still follow the patients in time. And if the curve 
demonstrates evidence of progression a little bit faster than our idiopathic natural history, then oftentimes I will take away the nidus or the driver, which is the Chiari. And so uh, I would oftentimes do the Chiari decompression as, uh, as demonstrated in this particular patient, but that's only if the patient actually demonstrates a progression or if the patient actually has some uh, uh, clinical reason or symptom, like a symptomatic Chiari, or if there's a syrinx that's starting to enlarge it, um, I will then consider doing a decompression. At the, that point, I will typically wait somewhere between three to six months because 60% of the time, even either the um, scoliosis actually improves or it actually stays the same. Um, and so I'll actually want to see a demonstration of worsening before I will consider any form of scoliosis correction, because oftentimes, potentially, you can place patients in braces um, and not need to allow for a surgical intervention. And yes, they have a small curve, but um, it's, uh, uh, that is okay, and I feel um, fine with following those patients in time. For the second example, I say a, a scoliosis and a, and a low grade or a high grade spondy, I'll, I'll essentially see um, uh, if the patient has any symptoms, particularly from the spondylolisthesis. If the patient has any uh, neuropathic pain or, or nerve related symptoms or radiculopathy, um, then obviously the focus would most likely be on that. Um, the only time I would focus on the scoliosis and I would separate the entities is if there is a, a demonstrated progression faster than the natural history or if they're progressing into a surgical round range, which based on our Weinstein studies get to about 45 to 50 degrees, will I consider an, consider an intervention because I know um, based on you know examples that we, we see and we will see that those will typically progress. And so I'll, I'll treat those two entities as separate entities, focusing on each individual aspect uh, within that visit. Hope that answers that question. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Um, <clears throat> So, um, uh, and, you know, this isn't just, uh, doesn't, uh, these sort of concepts uh, don't just uh, necessarily hold true for our pediatric population. This is a, a young lady in her 40s who, is, uh, who works on a ranch. She has uh, four boys. Um, her husband uh, also works as well. And um, uh, basically the, uh, the idea of seeing these individuals, and this is a patient who most likely had an adolescent progression, progression of a, excuse me, adult progression of a pediatric uh, uh, of a curve who's now starting to become symptomatic from the uh, coronal malalignment or the shift of her body off of the uh, uh, off of the midline. So if you were to draw a line straight up, uh, she would have a shift of her body uh, off the midline. The reason why we consider interventions on this these patients and these populations is because. Uh, I have the fortune of seeing patients both as from a pediatric population and also to an adult or older population, seeing her progression and I having an idea and understanding, or even if we followed her as well within a five or a 10 year period, her amount of listhesis or the amount of this vertebra, at, I'm gonna blow up on here, this vertebra here off the midline or even this L4 vertebra off the midline, it would then change the dynamic of the type of surgery that she was she would need. So addressing her in her early 40, 40s, allowing her to, us to stop at this particular level, saving instrumentation down into her sacrum and pelvis, continuing her um, uh, ability to get on and off the horse uh, as, as a rancher, considering interventions now will save her a significant operation or even a larger operation or perhaps even no operation uh, in the future. And it gives her an idea of a quality of life that's very important. And we don't have to take into some of the considerations that happen as far as bone strength and bone quality when we get older. We have to marry all this with regarding a lot of our health-related quality of life parameters. So I know Dr. Baj and Dr. Uh, um, Dr. Dachtele uh, get uh, essentially um, uh, uh, quality of life parameters to see how well patients are doing. And then we follow them in time, whether they have surgery or whether they don't have surgery to one, uh, make sure that the surgeries that we provide are, are actually helpful, but then also to get an idea of how bad patients are doing and are they having a worsening in time. This was a study that actually looked at patients who did have um, uh, scoliosis and they did have progression and they put patients in three categories, those that were untreated for their scoliosis, those that were brace treated and those that were surgically treated. And what's important to know is that the those in which the higher numbers better, by the way, those that actually were untreated and those who actually had um, 
uh, uh, never received any sort of surgical intervention had higher scores than those that actually had surgery. So even you can take that in a couple of different parameters and a couple of different ways. One, we want to make sure that we're not over treating patients because oftentimes those who don't who have never had surgery do better than somebody else who will have had surgery. So those who have never had a back surgery are oftentimes gonna do better than somebody who has had a back surgery. That doesn't mean those individuals who have had a back surgery are gonna have a, a bad life or in pain or, or less function because we have the opportunity to improve them. But if we can actually do things to modify patients so they don't have to have surgery, that's just as important for us as providers to communicate and talk to them uh, about modulating or somehow figuring out a way not to have surgery. But we also need to make sure that we intervene such that we're not too late and we're not intervening on large curves and large magnitudes. Because another study suggests that if we were able to stop at L2 as far as their distal level versus actually going lower, we save flexibility and motion levels so that patients who actually stop at L2 and higher do better than those that stop at L2 uh, and lower. This is a 75 year old and I don't want you to think that we don't, are, uh, we don't uh, we only treat patients who are young or in their 40s or 50s. There are individuals in that once we put all the things together, how they're doing, their coronal, how they're doing sagally or coronally, um, all their preoperative outcomes, all their forms, um, their, their, we, we had them see their internal medicine physicians and their primary care doctors, and we demonstrate that they're a good and safe candidate and they have a good uh, gestalt to do better, we are able to actually allow for an improvement of patient scoliosis and curvatures. And a lot of times for our adult population, there isn't a degeneration that's present. And as Dr. Baj mentions, we have to make sure that they don't have a listhesis because if they do have a listhesis somewhere, we are we likely, particularly for the adult, will need to correct that because oftentimes the stress moment uh, will allow that to worsen. So we need to incorporate that into our equation. But we also need to make sure that during the decompressions or during, excuse me, during the correction, uh, whether we need to do some form of a decompression so that we're not getting nerve pinch or um, uh, nerve irritation from the, from the concavity, those are important to also think about as well. So we can allow for an improvement in alignment in our patients, and it is important uh, for us to be able to monitor and make sure that patients are doing well uh, regarding their health-related quality of life parameters. So that comes into importance also. Um, our instrumentation and how we place it with the safety. There's many different strategies in many different ways. And uh, I just want to let you know, whatever way you choose, you need to make sure that it's the best one for you and your practice. Uh, oftentimes, particularly in our pediatric population, um, I, I, I like the freehand technique uh, based on the efficiency uh, that it allows for. You know, sometimes individuals um, uh, uh, may use the, the yellow arm and, and neuro navigation. Uh, other individuals may use the robot. It doesn't matter whatever uh, uh, is, is, is utilized as long as there's an efficiency within your hospital and within your team that one will allow for patient safety and, and everybody involved and to, to make sure that uh, things move through uh, quickly so that we're not creating any iatrogenic risk you know, for, for radiation to ourselves or our patients or even it being in the operating room for a long time. Um, you know, for our instrumentation, we need to make sure that we're not uh, too high or low within the pedicle to allow for nerve root irritation. And I'm trying to see which video this is. I think this is the one. So this is a, one of the techniques in which I use to place instrumentation. And it's just uh, um, essentially just uh, uh, cannulating into the pedicle, making sure that the walls are okay, and then placing the instrumentation uh, that's present through there, making sure that everything is fine. I like this particularly for larger, a lot of the larger, comp, uh, larger deformities. It will be a little bit challenging to visualize. I've started to incorporate uh, some augmented reality uh, as well that will allow me to be able to visualize that trajectory before I do the actual cannulation. Uh, but there's so many different ways in which you can place instrumentation that whatever is the safest for you and your facility uh, is probably the best. And so whether it's a combination of robotics or uh, neural navigation or um, uh, uh, um, augmented reality, whatever is the safest set at your institution is, is the most appropriate. Um, and this is a, another example um, of, of what we see here for uh, a young patient. Um, moving on to radiation and radiation exposure. I think that this is a, a topic and a discussion that's going to be more and more important uh, as we move forward. Um, uh, 
you know, thinking about the, the amount of uh, millisievers that is distributed or the amount of milligray that's distributed both to us as providers and then also um, to the patient, I think is going to be calculated. So uh, seeing if we can minimize the radiation exposure for our neuro navigation, um, I've started to use a a kind of the hybrid suite or the uh, angio suite, if you will, to place patients. And I'm just going to zoom in on this particular technology. And again, I have no disclosures, so I don't have any um, royalties or stock within any of these companies. And so I've started to use kind of a lower radiation or lower dose uh, uh, arm to visualize that uh, significantly distributes and excuse me, significantly lowers the radiation exposure to the patients. And so I think that these are going to be important concepts, as, uh, again, as it relates to safety, so that our patients we're not uh, giving them uh, undue radiation um, and balancing the, the safety of our instrumentation placement and our correction with the, the amount of radiation delivered to the patient uh, as well. Uh, if, anybody, feel free to stop me if, you, if, if I need to go over any additional things. Um, Another root aspect of safety is as it relates to uh, uh, operating room teams. Um, there have been uh, a significant amount of literature that shows the efficiency of having de dedicated, whether it's spine team or de dedicated neuro teams or dedicated teams that know each other um, with the anesthesia group, with the nursing group, uh, with the uh, circulating nurses um, and uh, uh, the surgeons um, that will allow for efficiency. So you can see a, a case in a procedure like this with the dedicated team Team. This is a, one example that we had where we can have a patient have a significant operation, um, be able to have an efficiency where we can do it in you know, about two and a half hours, um, or excuse me, a little less than three hours, excuse me, a little less than three hours um, from the time that we cut skin uh, for us to be able to allow for a very safe operation and, and operating room efficiency. Another aspect of radiation exposure, and I'm now starting to use, and I'm hoping I can get Dr. Adahdele to, to try to use this as well, is... Um, having longer longer exposures. Um, so traditionally there are 11 by 17 inch films that are in patients uh, and in most hospitals um, in which there is a, uh, uh, the exposure is an 11 by 17 or even a 17 by 17. Uh, but for some of the individuals, particularly for um, uh, if we're doing uh, kind of longer constructs, if we can visualize the whole spine, um, I think that, that will allow us to, uh, one, it minimizes the number of shots that are done within the operating room. In addition to, um, it allows you to visualize more of the spine. Um, and I uh, uh, have tried to incorporate that uh, as well. So all that aside, we also need to make, deci make decisions as far as what our expectations are and what patients' expectations are. You know, it's probably, and I don't wanna speak of, of regional differences, but I know that uh, when I was in a Missouri in fellowship, um, I can say that, you know, a patient going from a scoliosis uh, like here to a scoliosis um, here um, and an improvement in their overall alignment and their curvature and the balance of their spine to stop in the progression is okay. Uh, I don't know in Dr. Baj's practice and he, if he could attest, you know, the, the young folks in, 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 in Scottsdale um, or the, the, the folks in California, um, uh, if, you know, this would be satisfactory because oftentimes a lot of our individuals will want to be, will want to be absolutely perfect so that when they're in their, their Lululemon or the athleta, athletic uh, uh, attire or wear that uh, they don't have any asymmetry or their shoulders or their, 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 their pelvis is balanced or their, their belly button is symmetric. And so we have to have decision points. And so uh, thinking about whether we need perfect corrections or partial corrections, those are also important as far as uh, operating room efficiency because these sort of cases we can do very efficiently. Yes, we can do these cases more uh, uh, efficiently as well, but this is a significant reduction in, in time uh, in the operating room. It's also can, can allow for a significant cost reduction as well. Um, but we also need to make sure that we balance safety with education. Um, you know, Dr. Nader Dachtele is the uh, program director of uh, Northwestern. And, you know, one of the things that he oftentimes uh, has to balance, you know, particularly when, you know, he has to educate me, who is, uh, you know, a young resident uh, trying to grow and mature is uh, mentoring uh, the, the future of America uh, and the future of the, the Americas and, and, and the world, essentially, as far as uh, doing these final operations. And so training residents, training fellows, um, minimizing the time duration that we're in the operating room, but also making sure that, you know, Dr. Dr. Dachtele is one person, 
but as he continues, you know, five years from now, he will have extended his legacy to 40 individuals, and that will continue to evolve uh, as far as all the knowledge that he's gained, he'll be able to give to all of us. Yes, it makes for a little bit longer of a surgery and perhaps maybe a little bit higher of a blood loss, which some of these studies do suggest, but ultimately the outcomes of the patients are the same. And so it is very important that we balance the safety and the efficiency in the operating room with the absolute importance of training residents and fellows as we, uh, um, as we continue. So- Speaking of, uh, speaking of Dr. Dadale, uh, who's, who's teaching and, and mentoring all the time, there he is. It looks like he's in his surgical attire teaching some residents. Dr. Dadale, welcome. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you, Jamal. Uh, apologize, I'm a little late uh, to join. Uh, major delays today for some reason, but it's all good. Um, I'm enjoying uh, sitting back and listening. Uh, Jamal, who is, who's, I, I'm seeing there's someone in the back. Who's that in the background over there? Let's take a look. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I'm at the Children's Hospital today. The, uh, uh, okay, the giraffe yeah. in the background. Okay. Yes. Okay, sounds good. Well, yes. thank you, Jamal, uh, for uh, uh, joining us today. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this is complex stuff. I'm pretty impressed that uh, T2 to the pelvis, uh, major deformity, you guys got it down to three hours. This is pretty, pretty impressive. And definitely that would uh, obviate uh, multiple, you know, you know, blood losses and uh, VTE risk and uh, wound infection risk with uh, decreased uh, uh, surgical time, improving efficiency, but not at the cost of... Uh, outcomes. This is pretty impressive, Jamal. I mean, now mind you, Jamal, he's extremely technically gif gifted and <laughs> he's extremely proficient in uh, what he does. Keep going, Jamal. I'm sorry. I didn't uh, want to yeah, uh, no, thank you uh, very much. You know, a lot of this is just really focused on patient safety. So um, I uh, try to, to be as efficient as possible. And yes, there are times in which uh, challenges do arise, but, um, you know, a lot of the aspects of the, of the training and, and uh, you know, lectures like this and, and, and modules and uh, seminars um, and, and webinars are, are very critical and very important in us as colleagues to be able to interact because we are going to have challenges. And I know that there was a patient that Dr. Uh, Dr. Baj and I, we shared that uh, had a challenge uh, after the operation um, and which required a revision operation. And so us having this uh, forum and uh, having uh, our, all of our colleagues here um, on our virtual spine conference as well is very critical of how we continue to help uh, uh, the patients here. Uh, this is another example of a, of a young girl. And, you know, we could think of, you know, considering a kind of a, a smaller operation uh, on her, just focusing and stopping her curve progression. But a couple things that I worry uh, on her is, you know, will she need another operation, you know, five years down the line, 10 years down the line, or can we get us to a point where we, we stop all that and have just one operation? Now, I did her on the operating room on that kind of on a, on a pheno uh, with that, uh, that, uh, that low radiation uh, um, uh, arc, if you will, that was present in the angio suite, and I actually did her uh, operation in an angio suite, um, in which uh, I was able to minimize the amount of radiation for visualization. I actually corrected her, and if you were to look to see where I could potentially stop the operation, so if I draw a line straight up from the uh, the, the the sacrum here, it looks like it actually crosses at L4, and oftentimes we use a line straight up from the middle from the sacrum to see where we can actually stop, but I tried to, uh, to cheat a little bit and I actually stopped at L3 and bent a little scoliosis in here because she's a young girl and I wanted to see if that was okay for her um, to, to give her a little bit more flexibility. I could be wrong in five to 10 years, but um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic that that's a possibility because of what we do know within our literature, that one extra level from L3 to down, down to L4 does show some changes as far as uh, individuals having some pain and discomfort when they're in their, their, their early 30s and, and sometimes in their 40s. Um, you know, the risk comes into, particularly for the larger deformity, is that as curves get more angulated, so some of the congenital pathology or some of the not so smooth curves, if there starts to be create an angle, 
assuming an angle, uh, we have to be careful of the cord actually draping over the spine and us to have neurologic changes that are present. So for some of these curves, yes, this one has a, a little bit more of an angular deformity where this is rounded. We have to pay particular attention that we're not gonna develop any neurologic challenges or neurologic pathology uh, in, in and around the time of the correction. Yes, we're able to accomplish these very safely and succinctly, but we also need to ask ourselves, do we even need to get to the spine to this particular point here? Um, we can do fancy things with the bones as we can do bone cuts. And I know that um, uh, individuals have talked to you about, you know, doing subtracting vertebra and taking things out and, 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 and loosening up the spine. But a lot of times with our lot of, a lot of our modern instrumentation, the instrumentation is strong enough. And if we get good cannulation, a lot of the times we can avoid using some of these larger osteotomies that, you know, yes, they're pretty cool, but um, the question is whether they're, they're needed or not. Um, for individuals, particularly where the cord comes in, and I like to use this example, particularly uh, that's particularly important where the cord comes in and the cord is actually draped or we need to do something to shorten the cord, that's truly when the osteotomy is important or doing some form of shortening procedures is, is really critical because if the cord has some tensileness to it or there's a it's, a it's a tight cord, we need to do something to be able to soften or loosen the cord. And so really, I think that that's the, the, the strength and the power of doing an osteotomy osteotomy. So really, I think the osteotomies are designed to allow for a, an improvement of uh, cord tension um, and uh, things of that nature. Um, this is a, just a, a, another example that, that these things do happen in older individuals. These are 60 year olds uh, that are professionals that uh, have very uh, high impact uh, uh, jobs that, um, uh, that individuals can return back to the workforce in a very efficient time manner in three to four weeks uh, following these operations if they're done uh, correctly and efficiently. Neuromonitoring is really the critical safety portion once the patient receives the general anesthetic. So uh, we use all sorts of modalities, whether they're motor evoked potentials, somatosensory evoked potentials, the neurogenic evoked potentials, triggered EMG, uh, direct stimulation, epidural electrodes, uh, whatever you have at your institution that will allow for the safety for us to be able to monitor the cord. So that if there is a change, we have a sensitivity uh, to pick that up and then we can reverse um, what the last step that was performed. Um, I like to use the descending neurogenic evoke potential uh, because it stimulates the, uh, the, the dorsal columns and you can actually get uh, a motor wave uh, in some way. I don't know the, <laughs> the physiology behind it, but I know that it, it, it works. Um, and so that has been very sensitive uh, for me in my practice uh, uh, that picks up on neurologic changes. Um, I also like to use the D wave and the epidural electrode. There's been a lot of literature uh, that's shown that that is actually also very sensitive in picking up um, uh, neurologic changes, um, though uh, the tried and proven way is the motor evoked potential um, that, uh, um, but it, it also is dependent on the amount of, of um, uh, times our, our neural uh, technologist is stimulating the cord, but also it's sensitive to the, uh, the type of anesthetics used and to make sure that you have a, a total uh, intravenous a anesthetic uh, that is provided. And so there are some nuances to make sure that the neural monitoring is satisfactory. Blood loss and making sure that uh, each individual point you pay particular attention to how much blood is being lost or, or, or or um, that's present within the field is also critical. Uh, Cell Saver is a technology that is used to help recycle individuals' blood uh, that will get back to them. There are different types of things that are done in the operating room um, and depending on your dissection technique or your packing technique um, or even performing inferior facetectomies, there are different ways in which that's done. I historically used to use the osteotome and Dr. Dele can, can attest to, I use the osteotome to allow releases and you can see all this blood in the op in the uh, on the surgical field uh, that has significantly changed when we're provided providing these releases because there's some ultrasonic aspirators and the uh, the video unfortunately isn't playing for this this one down here um, it's not playing but I use an ultrasonic aspirator that will allow for the releases so uh, none of that blood is nearly as present as we see in the pre in the previous operation um, when we make decisions for transfusing because I like to to think about 
not transfusing patients, I think it creates an, it's a, an inflammatory cascade within the bloodstream and whether that actually precipitates infection uh, long term for individuals has not been proven, but I think minimizing the number of transfusion transfusion requirements are important. I have started to use the TEG or the thromboelastogram to actually uh, consider when certain blood products are needed. Um, it is a modality that's oftentimes used in transplants and liver transplants to figure out when actual transfusions are needed uh, for, for particular patients. Um, and so that is a newer modality. And I'm coming up to the, the conclusion here. Um, but as we continue to kind of grow, you've seen a lot of aspects of fusion uh, for correction. Uh, for a lot of times for our younger populations that we're starting to include now. This is not a technique that I was um, uh, uh, learned about in my residency or fellowship, uh, but even after residency. And so uh, all this is a continual learning process. I'm now starting to use growth modulation constructs. Uh, so fusionless operations for our, our early onset deformity or our growing spines. Some individuals are taking this and actually using these particular techniques and constructs for um, growing spines as well, even though there's no FDA approval for it, but it's uh, created a lot of controversy using what's called a vertebral body tethering for growing spines as well, and whether that there is advantages uh, or not uh, compared to our traditional um, uh, 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 constructs that we perform, particularly for these, uh, these adolescent curves, if you will, and what are the criteria based on the Saunders classification or how much growth potential somebody has um, is, uh, uh, is, very, is a very hot topic uh, right now. And so continual education is very important for, for, for patient safety because it gives you the armamentarium to be able to have very intelligent conversations of what a patient would particularly need or referring them to the to a provider that has the expertise within this uh, within within this arena is also uh, just as important from a safety perspective. And so uh, I wanted to uh, uh, conclude by thanking everybody, thanking the uh, uh, the group for uh, uh, joining me and allowing me to present uh, uh, for you today regarding some of my thoughts regarding safety within spinal deformity. I have uh, uh, I appreciate uh, uh, answering any questions. I want to thank Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Ali Baj and Dr. Nader Dahtale for allowing me to uh, to talk to everybody today. So thank you. Thank you, Jamal. That was uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, you know, we can spend hours on this, and and you, you clearly have a very diverse practice, and and you know, technically outstanding results. So congratulations. Um, we do have a couple of minutes, and and uh, if it's okay with you and Nader, we have one question from uh, uh, from Dr. Baisa, who's uh, obviously a long time uh, supporter and loyal to our program. Uh, he says that um, uh, in pediatric scoliosis with that tethered cord or split cord malformation, either tethered cord or split cord malformation, uh, can you discuss your strategy? Uh, do you release first uh, and, and then stage the, do you release first and, and perform that scoli correction I'm assuming he's asking or do you stage it and see, and see what happens to the curve? Yeah, great, uh, great question. So I oftentimes uh, perform that uh, the tethered cord release, or if there is a split cord malformation and an associated bar, I will um, essentially release the, uh, uh, the the phylum in addition to remove the cartilaginous or the bony bar that's there. I would then follow the patient over uh, three to six month time window. If there's been no progression, I'll continue to follow them. However, um, if there has been a progression of their spinal curvature, I'll then consider an operative intervention. And a lot of times it would be very similar to the type of construct uh, as I showed you within the, the Chiari and the, and the, and the syrinx, uh, if you will. But I typically really, um, uh, I'm very conservative. I, I would prefer not to do an operation. Um, and so I would par perhaps shy away unless the patient really kind of demonstrated a, a significant progression faster than the natural history. And the reason why I use three to six months is, is because that I, I have seen explosions of curve uh, within a year time point where a lot of the neurogenic causes for scoliosis can explode 20 to 30 degrees within a year and get very, very dramatic. Now, granted, that's anecdotal, but it's been far, far too many individuals uh, for me to wait an entire year to consider an operative intervention. And so that's why I really use that three to six month window. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I think the key is... Um, you know, for a lot of these conditions in which there is both a spinal anomaly as well as a vertebral column deformity, um, you know, if you do decide to stage them, the, the most important thing, as with many, many things we do, is follow up, you know, follow the patient, follow them closely, both clinically and radiographically. Um, 
especially in the growing spine. That's incredibly important. Um, well, uh, Jamal, thank you so much. That was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I don't know if Do Dr. Godley, do you have any final words? Uh, just uh, thank you, Jamal, for this excellent uh, presentation. I, I, I think missed maybe 22 minutes of it, but uh, you know, it's uh, it's always great uh, to have uh, previous uh, trainees who are uh, you know honestly re leaders leaders in the field. I mean, Jamal is one of the very few neurosurgeons who's who does uh, uh, pediatric scoliosis uh, uh, as a significant part of his practice. Um, and he's fellowship trained in peds and uh, also scoliosis very unique because we spoke about this, you know, uh, whether or not we need to have a dedicated uh, pediatric uh, scoliosis rotation for neurosurgeons. And Ali uh, brought this up uh, on Twitter. And I think, uh, you know, you got to experience this to get to, to see the variety of cases. And I'm sure many, many uh, neurosurgeons like uh, Jamal will get, in, will get into uh, uh, pediatric scoliosis and uh, get special subspecialized in that. I mean, the, the spine surgery is, is a very wide field right now. I mean, you got to subspecialize, and I'm really a big proponent of, of subspecialization. I think subspecialization would pull, will push the field forward. It's a good thing being having on a, a niche and uh, doing these cases in, day in, day out. I mean, this, this would open the door for innovation, and that's how we advance the field through subspecialization. So, just kudos to uh, Jamal, and thank you for joining us today. And we're going to invite you back soon uh, with me being there from A to Z. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no problem. I just want to thank uh, again, uh, Dr. Dr. Leigh for having me, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ali Baj for having me as well. Thanks for all the participants and all the individuals that joined us today. I hope it was enlightful and feel free to contact me with anything. And, and um, I, I definitely appreciate everybody's time and I welcome, welcome coming back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamal. Uh, next week, uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Koi Fan. Koi Fan will be hosting, and um, he has invited Dr. Byron Stevens, who's an orthopedic spine surgeon at Vanderbilt. Um, and he uh, will be discussing kind of the same theme in terms of deformity, but um, I believe his specific topic is when to avoid uh, the, you know, the three column osteotomies and when basically to get more with less. Uh, that's uh, next week. Uh, and until then, thank you again, Jamal, Nader, and uh, my fellow co-hosts and panelists. Uh, have a great week, everyone, and we'll uh, see you next Thursday. Great. See you, bye.